we will first begin by um, how our work is even possible. So creating partnerships. Bridgeport Public Schools has realized um, classroom teachers cannot do this work alone. Now, yes, classroom teachers are superstars and educators in general go above and beyond every day, but without um, the partnerships that we've created, um, our social emotional learning movement in Bridgeport um, wouldn't be possible. Um, I'm gonna start out by showing a little video clip about part of the social emotional learning work taking place currently in Bridgeport. Social emotional learning is the big umbrella and it, underneath that are many interventions. And one of the interventions that the district has taken on and that began five years ago is the ruler approach. We identified one of the challenges here in Bridgeport is that we are in a very high, um, highly mobile district. We have students that could be in one, two or three different schools in one year. And so it was very, um, the implementation of the ruler approach was actually very um, intentional, very thoughtful, and very well planned so that we could implement it across the entire district. RULER is an acronym, and RULER stands for R, to recognize the emotions, yours and others. U is understanding the causes of those emotions. The L is to label it. You've got to name it to tame it. Uh, e is expressing. And the fifth and probably the most important is regulating. If they can't regulate their emotions, they're not ready to learn academically. Um, so if they come in and they're upset about something that happened at home, they're not ready to sit down and do their work. They need to take a moment and talk about it or take a little break or whatever they need, but they're not going to come in angry or sad and get right to work. We know enough about um, the importance of SEL for students um, academic performance um, and their uh, well-being in general, uh, we know enough about that to invest in it. The district uh, developed a social and emotional learning task force and the task force is really comprised of um, social workers, teachers, administrators, um, school resource officers, as well as community agencies that do work in the school and are part of this partnership. In addition to that, um, each school developed their own um, social and emotional learning team within the school. What we found was that um, it was very important to include parents. We focused on coaching and leadership development through the frame of RULER. If you're able to recognize your feelings, um, and regulate your feelings more importantly, and you're feeling better about what you're doing, that should definitely have an impact on what you're doing. So think about how you're feeling today and why. Then when we're done, we take time in the beginning of the year to really build those relationships with each other, learn how to express themselves with each other, so that you know once they've gotten that piece out of the way, then we kind of focus on the academic piece. And we try and like at this point in the year, we're trying to blend the two. So a lesson might include reading a story and then looking at that character and mapping that character on the mood meter. So they're getting the educational, the academic side of reading comprehension, but we're also tying it into their emotions. It's all about building relationships and connecting with your students. And if you can do that, then they'll succeed. We've seen teachers implementing the core aspects of RULER and seeing improvement on those implementation indicators over time. We've started to see uh, even more uh, reductions in in-school and out-of-school suspensions. Just by walking into some of the schools that have truly embraced this, you can see a very um, different culture. You see less frustration, less outbursts, you see less disruption because they're fixing a problem and it's not, you know, I'm upset and I'm going to explode. It's, you know, I'm upset and I have the tools to deal with this. Oops, not yet. They're not getting as easily upset. It's empowering for them. You know, they feel like, okay, I can stand up for myself in a way where I'm not hitting them back or making the wrong choice, but it gets their feelings out and it solves the problem. The biggest impact that I see is when I see an eighth grader come down to the office to take a meta moment. 
and by sitting in the rocking chair that we have in the office. And so that that's an impact in and of itself. The younger kids will do it, but when you see an eighth grade male come into the office saying, I need to take a moment, and he goes and he sits in a rocking chair and he starts rocking, that is impact. My assessment thus far is that it's, uh, well, first of all, it's grown well beyond what my expectations were. Children that were able to self-report about being able to regulate themselves had one grade point higher um, on their report cards. And students that also self-reported that they were able to regulate had better attendance. These young people coming from K-8 are going to filter into our high schools, reshape the climate and environment that currently um, resides in our high schools. And when people come to our schools and they feel good about themselves and they're honored and validated and supported, then they can do well academically. One of the reasons why I felt it was really important um, to show that video clip is because creating partnerships to help address the whole child is incredibly important. Um, Bridgeport's lucky um, that we had such incredible partners that help us with this work, and each of our partners supported us in a different aspect. Um, as explained, um, the Tauk Family Foundation helped us financially, but it also helped guide us as educators to things that we might not be aware of. They, they can look at things through a lens um, that is unlike our own, and that's been extremely beneficial. Also, the other partners up here, Safe Schools, Healthy Students, has been a huge support for improving school climate in the Bridgeport Public Schools. Also, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence um, trained us in the ruler approach. Um, the five skills to be addressed using four anchor tools that will be explained a little later on in the PowerPoint. Uh, Yale School of Medicine, the consultation center, really helped us with um, tracking data, um, looking at student outcomes in terms of attendance, in terms of in-school and out-of-school suspensions, um, and our, our graduation rate, um, not through Yale, but our graduation rate is the highest it's been in years, over 70%, where Bridgeport really um, struggled with making sure that our students went all the way through um, graduation. Um, the um, Bridgeport Child Advocacy Coalition, BCAC, is a community-based organization that's been incredible on our SEL journey because BCAC is on the ground in our city. They know um, various um, community partners that make our work um, possible and enhance our students' lives in um, every area. Um, mental health, um, training our social workers in um, CBITS in order to address um, childhood traumas that our students face. So um, all of these partners are um, very important to our SEL work. When I first came into Bridgeport, I worked um, at an East End school. Um, my undergraduate degree was in English, and I went back to school after substitute teaching to get my master's in secondary English education. The training that I received in my teacher training did not help me understand um, the importance of emotions. And I didn't even know, I don't think, what behavioral expectations were in a classroom. Um, I definitely knew my content area. And I knew literature. And I was prepared to teach it. And my methods and materials class taught me all these amazing things. And when I got into the classroom, I definitely felt unprepared. Um, I connected with my students um, more in a haphazard way because I, because I love them and I love people, but it wasn't done with, intention with, with intentionality. So um, the first program that, um, or it's actually not a program, it's a framework that I came across was PBIS or school-wide SWPBIS. And what this looked like at, um, at the school where I was, was showing the students how we expected them to behave in certain areas of our school. And 
And in order to do that, the students would create posters about hallway expectations, cafeteria expectations, bathroom expectations. Because when we were in the classroom, students would share the places that they felt unsafe. And it was not in our classrooms. So when they were in school and they would say, I don't feel safe at school, I was confused by that until these, these um, fears were explained to me by the kids themselves. I realized the importance of the PBIS system, which told me as an educator, instead of looking for things that needed to be fixed or problem behavior that I needed to address, the lens that I should be looking at is, what behaviors do I want to promote? And those are the things that I'd give an elbow bump for or a shout out to, to a student like, oh yeah, he's, he's on top of it today. Those little rewards that make every child motivated to repeat or, or consistently partake in the behavior that they, they were recognized for. Um, You'll be hearing a little bit more about PBIS from our district PBIS guru, so I don't want to explain too much about that exposure, but that was really my first experience in Bridgeport um, with looking at behavior as something that I, as an educator, needed to teach and to understand on a deeper level. Our current vision, um, our new superintendent, we just created our new strategic plan. And I absolutely love our strategic plan because our vision is, um, is to have a culturally responsive, high performing learning environment where students thrive academically, socially, emotionally, and civically. And that is incredible. But what does that mean? How do we, how do we achieve this goal? So in order for our vision to become a reality, our students, families, community members, and staff need to increase our own emotional intelligence and cultural competence. And the way that Bridgeport is going about doing this is introducing restorative practices and combining that with the ruler approach. By implementing these, we'll deepen our understanding of each other, and our ability to appropriately respond to the cultural variables that make our district and community so unique. Bridgeport, if you have not been to Bridgeport, is a really incredible, amazing place. Unfortunately, if you heard in our keynote, a lot of, of what gets publicized about my district are our struggles. And we do have many struggles. And there are lots of reasons for these struggles, but our job as educators is to play with the cards we're dealt. We know that each and every child that enters our school system is capable of amazing things, academically, behaviorally. Those are just natural outcomes when you create a safe learning environment tailored to each child's individual needs. Cultural competence. I did have a, a definition up here. Cultural competence means different things to different people. So just so we're all speaking the same language, when we're talking about cultural competence today, we're going to be talking about the ability to appropriately respond to various cultural variables. And those include, and are not limited to, um, Ability, age, beliefs, ethnicity, experience, gender, gender identity, linguistic background, national origin, race, religion, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. All inclusive. Sometimes when people talk about cultural competence, they think of race exclusively. And that is really not the case. And when you look at it through just that lens, you're missing the big, bigger picture. And you're also taking away very important aspects of our children's stories. What they come to the table with is more than just what you may see sitting or standing in front of you. I get this question from my family a lot. Um, I come from a family um, of accountants and um, they're very numbers driven and my um, love for exploring literature and hugs 
doesn't really translate in my own family. So when I explained my new position, coming from a classroom English teacher to the social emotional learning coordinator, of course, I got some pretty odd looks. Uh, what do emotions have to do with teaching, Carrie? And that's when I came alive, because it's everything. All learning is social and emotional. Emotions are incredibly important. They, they drive attention, memory, and learning, decision making, and judgment, relationship quality, physical and mental health, as well as everyday effectiveness. And students with learning challenges, this is especially important for them, but it is also important for the adults. Um, I think a lot of times educators forget that our emotions matter incredibly also. Our students are very perceptive. If we are kind of not addressing an elephant in the room when we're dealing with our own personal struggles, our students sense that. Um, if you have a sick pet at home and you don't mention to your students in the beginning of class or walking them upstairs, depending on the age level of your students, oftentimes you might have somebody from that class say, is everything all, is everything all right? Because they get it. They know us as people, and it is vitally important for us as educators to know them, each and every one of them. Emotional intelligence matters because people with higher emotional intelligence exhibit these things. They have less anxiety, less depression, they're less aggressive, less likely to quote unquote bully other children. They pay more attention and tend to be less hyperactive. They also have uh, greater leadership skills and they perform better academically. Emotions matter a great deal in every classroom, whether you're in a pre-K classroom or you're in an AP physics class in high school, emotions do matter. At the high school level, level you may see frustration take a different form but it's still that same emotion that uh, a preschooler is experiencing when they're struggling to zip up their jacket. That high school student taking that AP physics class, instead of giving up, what do we want them to do? We want them to push through it, seek for other avenues, collaborate with their peers. Have we as educators taught them the skills needed to problem solve? That's part of why Bridgeport is taking such a strong approach in social emotional learning, to be able to provide our students with the skills they need um, to grapple with difficult things that they're gonna be experiencing for the rest of their lives. The ruler approach is the second form of kind of social emotional learning that I was exposed to. So my first experience with PBIS was showing the expectations in the various places, classroom, hallway, um, bathroom. Then about five years ago, um, a partnership between the Yale Center for the Yale Consultation Center and the Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence came to Bridgeport and trained um, first at the district level and then um, cohorts of teachers. If you remember in the video, it said each school created an SEL team. That was very necessary for the rollout of our work. And I'll explain why. That SEL team made up of an administrator, a clinician, as well as classroom teachers provided um, each school with a resource required to provide teachers, families, and students training, ongoing training and support at each school. The district realized having um, district personnel trained is definitely important. However, having school-based teams are the on-the-ground supports that really make um, the ruler approach thrive. The ruler approach um, it sets out to teach five skills. Those five skills are on the right. 
It's actually the acronym RULER. So as you can see, being able to recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate your emotions is, are the five skills RULER seeks to address. In order to do that, they have four anchor tools. The first anchor tool is the charter. The second anchor tool is the moon meter. The third anchor tool is the meta moment. And the fourth anchor tool is the blueprint. We're going to be walking through those um, various anchor tools now. Um, it's basically the vision and framework for your school climate or your class climate. So what you would do is you identify how you want to feel when you enter school. How do you want to feel when you enter the class? As an educator, um, we created staff charters. So when we were first teaching educators about ruler, we did these activities as if they were students. So we brought in our educators and we created a staff charter. So we said, when you come to work, how do you want to feel? And we listed out those things. Ironically, the staff charter and how adults want to feel when they come to work almost directly mirrors students and how they want to feel when they come to school. So my students in my middle school classroom, number one, wanted to feel safe. The staff members at um, the elementary school where I was teaching, it's a pre-K-8 school, the number one way staff members wanted to feel when they came to work? Any guesses? Safe. Number one, students and staff. Students and teachers wanted to feel respected and valued. Those are commonalities between adults and students. We held parent workshops. We said, how do you want to feel when you come to your child's school, respected, valued, heard, understood, safe. Step two is what specific things are you, as an individual, agreeing to do to help us feel that way, to create that type of environment. Um, very often, both students and adults want to say what other people will do. So what are we going to do to feel that way? Well, the principal is going to make sure that the copier works. And you need to say, no, this is what we're going to be agreeing to do. So what are you going to bring to the table? How am I going to help my students feel safe? I'm going to stand at the door and open and welcome each student um, into the building in the morning when they arrive. That is creating safety. Just by that position, not only am I showing my students that I care about them and I'm excited to see them in the morning, but it's also strategic. I'm there to make sure that the right people are coming in that door. No, I am not a security guard, but as we all know, educators wear many hats. And being an extra safety measure for the school, I am more than happy to do. Um, that's one simple way of um, listing what I can do to add to the safety of um, my students and families. Uh, three, plan out action steps that you're going to take when conflicts arise. We know that there will be conflicts. What are you going to do ahead of time to be proactive when these conflicts arise? If I hear somebody gossiping about me, am I going to turn to my group of friends or colleagues even, and start talking about that person? No, if something needs to be addressed, one thing that I might agree to, when conflicts arise, I, I agree to address the problem or the issue directly. Oftentimes, educators spend times in the teacher's lounge not being very productive or not addressing a problem head on. Instead of going to administration and making them aware of a certain situation, um, people go into bad habits. And some of those are not very effective. So agreeing and making a conscious effort as the adult, what am I going to do when conflict arises? And then list out those things. That's creating a charter. Um, 
I created charters with each one of my classes because I um, had students rotate. I had 120 students and they rotated four classes at a time. And I created an individual charter with each of them. Because unlike a, a list of rules, even if I create those rules with the kids, which I always used to do, now I create charters with them. And instead of pointing out things that they can't do, it's pointing out how we are gonna come to school and how we are gonna contribute to this positive learning environment that we're creating together. The mood meter is the second anchor tool that um, Ruler uses. And um, if you follow along the, I'm gonna, re I'm gonna try to do the pointer and bear with me. Um, oh yay, it worked. Um, if you follow all along the X axis, moving from left to right, um, it shows how pleasantness increases. And this Y axis is energy. So low energy all the way to high energy. The, um, creating four boxes or quadrants. Um, this mood meter is um, designed to help students um, recognize and label their emotions. So if I said, um, how do you feel this morning? And the, the student was really excited because we had a debate and they were really well prepared for it and they knew they were just gonna crush it. And the student's like, oh my gosh, miss, I'm so excited. Where would you put yourself on the mood meter today? So the student was excited. Maybe they're very pleasant. They might say, oh miss, I'm, I'm a 4-3 today. And for a debate, being in the yellow at, at a 4-3 is a pretty good thing. In debates, you wanna be high energy. Um, depending on the topic, you might wanna be really, really positive. Clearly, the student felt prepared for this debate, or those might not be the feelings that they were feeling coming into school that day. Let's say that child instead had a really rough night. Their little brother ends up having to go to the emergency room from a severe asthma attack. They didn't get to review their materials for to today's debate. When that child comes into the room on debate day and they go to plot their, their feelings on the mood meter, it's gonna give me a huge clue as an educator. They're gonna come in my door. I have this poster set up. I have solo cups, one in each box. And when the child who had that rough day comes in and puts themselves over here or here on the mood meter in the red or the blue, depending on energy level, because we might be really tired from that late night. But we could be higher energy, depending on our, if our nervousness is increasing our energy levels and making our heart pound and our hands shake. Depending on where that child plots themselves, without even speaking a word, I know that I need to check in with that student. And I don't teach preschool students. I taught at the high school level and at the middle school level. And this is very important for adolescents. Gauging where they are, because many adolescents are better at hiding those feelings. How often do we get, fine. Hey, how you doing today? Fine. Because of that, some of these nonverbal ways of checking in with students is key to helping them succeed in the classroom. So when that student puts their little uh, clip into that bucket, I know to go over to them and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You doing okay? And I'm like, miss, oh my gosh, I really don't want this debate to happen. I'm like, you got this, I saw you in class. You, you were going through with your teammates and they're like, yeah, but, but, but my little brother, we were in the hospital with him, I'm so tired. And we have a number of, of ways to work this out. Usually, my students would choose to either take a, take a break, run down and talk to somebody that's really important, or sit in, a, in an area in my room, um, it's, it's actually like a little chill zone, and sit there and maybe journal write about their night. 
instead of reviewing their materials because at that point, reviewing their materials wouldn't have happened if they didn't get to get off their chest what they were scared or afraid of or what was keeping them up at night. And once that reflection happens, you could literally see in their bodies, their shoulders relax, they're calmer. Sometimes if they remember, they'll go and move their, their mood in the mood meter, but at that point, that's not what's really important. The connection between the teacher and the student has already occurred and has helped that student shift their emotion from a quadrant that, that's not really conducive to learning into a more appropriate, a, a, a calmer um, state. The um, next ruler anchor tool is the meta moment. And boy, do I wish I had <laughs> this simple six step process when I was growing up. Instead, I was sitting in front of the principal's office for getting out of my seat, for talking, um, shock. Um, but I was a good kid. I wanted to do well in school. I loved school. I loved my peers. I was so excited to go to school. And many kids like myself can barely contain their excitement, cause a tremendous amount of challenges for their classroom teachers because that's not always the easiest behavior to deal with. And other children, I was told this many times throughout my life, other children need to learn. So removing me and my mouth did make it a lot easier for my teacher to relay information to the other kids in the class. And I knew I was being excluded. And I knew I was a problem. So how do we help our, our, our children? What, what kind of skills or tools are we putting into their bucket? And the meta moment helps us give time between an event that happens and our response. And that time alone, along with strategies, will help the kids be able to regulate their emotions. I do not want to use the word calm down because it's actually incorrect. A lot of teachers think this, this tool helps us calm down students so, so they're quiet and then, and then we can all learn. And that's not really the tool. Uh, it's not really the purpose of the meta moment. So there are six steps to the meta moment. First, something happens. Woo. First, something happens. An event occurs. So let's say I'm driving to this conference today. Everything's going great. I have my music on in the car. I'm super pumped. And a car cuts me off. I don't have time to think. Immediately, I break. I feel my heart pounding. I feel my hands start sweating. And that's what I'm sensing. So after the immediate danger happens, because I, I, I had to press on the brakes, I need to stop and I need to think. Because I have a couple, a couple things I could do here. I could slam on my horn and start saying obscenities that fly through my head. Or I could picture my best self. And I could think, I've made mistakes when I was driving before. I've accidentally cut people off before. Everything that happens is not necessarily intentional. So what strategies am I going to use to calm down, to settle my heart rate? I'm going to possibly do some deep breathing. I do that often when it's snowing. I do not like driving in the snow. Some calming strategies or the reframing that I did before, saying, Carrie, this was probably a mistake. You've cut people off accidentally before. Don't get too upset. And when I use those strategies, I can be successful. So what does successful mean in this six step process? Does it mean all the problems in the world are solved? No, of course not. But it means I was my best self. I was able to portray something that I'm proud of. I didn't react inappropriately by following behind this car, flashing my lights and honking the horn for the next 20 minutes. That kind of toxic stress 
is bad for us, bad for us as adults. And when students experience toxic stress repeatedly from not being able to regulate their emotions or the things in their environment, it has some very serious health consequences. So it is important that we teach these students a variety of strategies and that we teach educators and parents and community members a variety of strategies because students see what goes on around them and it's important that we as adults are modeling what we expect. The last anchor tool that Ruler um, uses is called the blueprint. So instead of that typical, why'd you do that? You don't start with why, because very often uh, our, our kids, our students can't tell us why. So saying what happened, what happened, what caused my feelings? How did I express or regulate my feelings? And what could I have done to handle this situation better then? And what can I do now? Those things are very important. And it reminds me of, uh, of a book called Zach Gets Frustrated. In this book, Zach is the main character. I've used this book to teach the blueprint to the students. Zach's the main character. So the kids need to identify, how did Zach feel in the beginning of the book? I'm giving you a little background. Zach was at the beach with his family and he was trying to fly a kite. And unfortunately, the wind wasn't picking the kite up and the kite kept crashing down and landing in the ground. So Zach stomped over to his dad. He's like, can we leave? And his dad was confused because he didn't really understand. Zach liked the beach, so what's going on? Zach had to name the fact that he was frustrated. He learned how to name that. Then he learned strategies to tame that frustration. And at the end of that book, he learned how to reframe it or learn how to see what he could have done differently. His dad taught him strategies, some deep breathing, some meditation, which are also strategies that I use in the meta moment and many of our teachers implement in our classrooms. Couple, coupling the ruler approach with restorative practices is extremely important. The whole premise of restorative practices is to build positive relationships. That is key to restorative practices. In fact, 80% of the time, restorative practitioners spend building those positive relationships. They build those with their colleagues, they build those with their classroom, they build within their classroom, they build those with parents. The first phone call of the year about how excited you are to have their child in your class or an activity they did really well, those positive connections are incredibly important. Circles build relationships and help create a sense of belonging. They're fundamental to creating a restorative climate because every single person is seen and heard. Everybody's valued. Nobody is more or less important than the other. This can be a tough switch for a lot of educators. Educators are used to a hierarchy. In fact, many areas of our society follow that hierarchy mentality. Just like our military and just like our prisons. In our schools, we need to rethink those ideas because that doesn't always work. Somebody telling you what to do all the time isn't effective. We're doing something wrong. So the restorative framework teaches us to do with. There are high levels of support in this process, and there are very clear consequences. Many educators think restorative practice doesn't hold students accountable, and in fact, it holds students and educators more accountable. Having the support there for both, for all parties, is very important also. Circles are a safe place where we can build off the ideas of others, question, wonder, reflect, realize how our actions impact others, whether that impact is intentional or unintentional. 
when mistakes or misbehaviors occur, we seek to not fix the problem, but we seek to restore the damage that's been done. And without the foundational relationships we've built, how do you repair harm? So creating those relationships is a cornerstone to restorative practices. There are three main shifts to switch from uh, toward restorative schools and classrooms. Efforts to suppress misbehavior based on a view that it's uh, failing students or classrooms. It's very common, you know, to being able to recognize and using the inherent value of misbehavior as an opportunity for social emotional learning and growth. Oftentimes, students don't recognize the impact they have on others. So it's important that we point out those impacts to them so they're able to see why they should change their behavior. They didn't intend to cause harm. Or if they did, that harm went beyond what they were expecting. Going from an authority-driven disciplinary actions that focus on what the um, misbehaving students did to um, Restorative circles that bring everyone together um, to show how people, uh, to help the people that were immediately impacted by the incident. The idea of punishment and exclusion is prevalent in our school system. Kicking out of the classroom, whether it's in ISS or OSS, it's giving the same message to our kids, and that's the, that they need to be removed. They're not part of our group if they can't act the way we want them to act. Instead, the restorative mindset is opening up a dialogue, allowing the, that understanding and action to set things right and repair and restore relationships. But once again, building those relationships is key. This is also reviewing a little more about uh, restorative practices, acknowledging that relationships are central to building community, building systems that address misbehavior and harm in a way that strengthens relationships. Meaning when something happens, I have my students call for a circle. They'll be like, miss, we need a circle up. Maybe somebody in their group said something that, that hurt one of their classmates. It's important that that gets addressed and students should feel that they have the voice and the power to make that happen. A teacher is not needed to do that. Now, would I recommend leaving the room while the students had these circles? No. Um, being there as a guide, a facilitator, is obviously very important. Um, but giving students autonomy, um, I feel, is extremely effective. I've seen first graders call their own circles. And by God, it was the cutest thing I think I've ever seen in my life, um, probably because I'm used to older kids. But I just really didn't think they were capable of doing that on their own. And they're six. And I saw a student call for a circle because somebody called um, this, this little girl a big fat potato chip. And she wasn't having it. And she said, we need a circle. And I said, OK, call, call the circle. And she, they all circled up and she explained why that hurt her feelings and they went around sequentially one of the types of circles that restorative practices use. And they explained times where, where names have hurt them, times that they have used, um, called somebody a name when they shouldn't have and what they could have done differently. Um, giving voice to um, the person harmed and um, making sure that we're aware that the quote unquote victim might not be the only person harmed. Oftentimes, harm expands beyond who we in, intend that harm. So if I, if I um, threw a desk because I was mad at my teacher, um, another classmate in that room who may be dealing with domestic violence at home might not say anything, but that, that impacts their learning to a great degree. And until that circle happens, you may never know how other people in your classroom are affected by some inappropriate behaviors. And the child who's causing those inappropriate behaviors may also not be aware of the effect they're having on their classmates. 
Restorative justice and restorative practices are very similar, but it's important to make some distinctions between them. Restorative um, justice is a way of thinking about conflict. Whereas restorative practices set, a, um, set some protocols that help build community and relationships, and it's not centered around conflict. Remember, 80% of the time in restorative practices, it's about positive relationship building. Um, through academic instruction, I circle up with my kids to teach um, all types of literature using a fishbowl and in academic instruction, um, allowing for dialogue and discussion um, is very important. Um, restorative justice, a process, uh, process by which parties with a stake in a particular offense resolve collectively with an aftermath of offense and implications going forward. Restorative justice has a set, um, there are set procedures in place that take a trained practitioner in order to, um, to hold a restorative justice circle properly. Um, so that is not what every single educator in our district is learning how to do. We're looking at restorative practices where we can work in restorative ways by getting to know each other, um, not separate from academic instruction, but with academic instruction, where we actively listen to one another and teach students what active listening is, um, explain that in certain cultures like ours, eye contact and looking at, the, uh, looking at the person speaking in terms of body position, facing the person speaking are signs of respect, even though in some cultures that's not the case. So making sure that norms are explained and cultural expectations are explained in certain environments, having students share how their culture may differ and then you might decide to create different norms. So maybe there will be another way that you're showing that you're being an active listener. One of my students, it feels very uncomfortable with eye contact. So he doesn't keep eye contact, but he does, he does a snap when something resonates with him in the classroom. And that's one way that he's not only showing he's actively listening, but showing respect to the speaker. Um, Restorative justice holds students accountable, repairs harm, begins the healing process, and allows for reintegration into society or into the community, whether it's a classroom um, or otherwise. Um, and lastly, on the restorative practice side, create a foundation of trust, empathy, and safety. I apologize for jumping around here. I'm short on time, so I'm trying to go quickly. In our district, we created an OSS pilot task force to look at certain data. Our objective was to reduce and eventually eliminate out of school suspensions and chronic absenteeism, which um, a lot of our funders, this information and this data is extremely important for them. As a classroom teacher, you could feel the climate switch when you um, use the ruler approach and restorative practices under that SEL umbrella and the framework that was already created through our PBIS system. So our task force, we selected four pilot schools. We established the SEL teams, scheduled ruler refreshers, restorative practice trainings, and then we held monthly meetings and collected various types of data. So from, um, clearly you could tell that the effects of our work are, are, are fairly shocking. Um, our out of school suspensions from 2009 to 17 were basically cut in half. Now, is all of this due to one approach or one program? I would argue no. It's a holistic approach to educating our children that caused these um, numbers. Um, PBIS, growing into using the, restore, uh, the uh, ruler approach, realizing that those two in and of themselves weren't addressing all the problems we needed, bringing in the restorative practice piece to really shift our mindsets from punitive to restorative. And with those going forward, 
There are some uh, more data slides here out of school suspensions with just the four pilot schools. Chronic absenteeism, the overall number in the third column did decline for all four pilot schools. Over the course of five years, OSS has decreased 45.8% and ISS decreased 74.6% in all four pilot schools. Remember, this work also takes time. And that's part of the problem. If you're looking for immediate results, you're not going to get it through effective measures because real change does take time. We basically, I mean, I want to make sure that I leave a couple of minutes for questions and answers. So um, I am definitely going to skip through a lot of the materials that I had here. But I think that um, if there's one thing that I want to make sure that everybody leaves with, uh, you know, when you leave here today, is that none of this is going to happen if we don't have the staff buy-in, but also if we don't have the administrative support. Okay, one of the greatest challenges that we've had over the years, I've been doing this for the past maybe 14, 15 years, um, has been administrative support. Um, with that being said, administration comes from the top, right? So we're talking about, um, you know, from the superintendent down to the very last person that's in the building. Um, and it also takes really, uh, you know, getting the community to be supportive. So when we set out to do this um, at uh, Johnson School, one of the things that we said was we want to make sure that we bring all of these stakeholders, right, at one point or another. We want to make sure that we uh, train them, we give them information about the, you know, the uh, different, um, you know, whether it's PBIS or ruler or uh, uh, restorative practices in terms of, you know, what is it, um, what, how do we uh, do it in our school, right, how do we, you know, kind of like adjust it, and then what can you do to be a part of this. So we really have made it a, you know, point that, you know, all stakeholders are going to be uh, a part of this. So. Um, you know, again, I won't go over the, you know, the definitions of PBIS, but just to remind you, it is um, uh, a system-wide approach, right, uh, to discipline. Uh, we want to make sure that we do this with the ultimate um, intention of really improving, uh, you know, student performance, right, um, whether it's academic or whether it's behavior, uh, and that really is what we want to do. When we achieve that, then we know we've created that safe environment, you know, for all of these stakeholders. Um, PBIS, um, can I just see a quick show of hands? How many of you know about this triangle? How many of you have seen it? Okay, very good. So I won't go into this, you know, into the details. But again, most importantly, um, that, you know, it is school-wide. Um, it helps create that, you know, culture that we want. It benefits everybody. And it recognizes also, you know, when students do well. And not just students, really, but also, uh, you know, the staff as well. Um, some of the schools, uh, one of the schools where I worked at, um, we uh, created what we call the, um, the, ti the fairy tiger. Um, and we decided that we were going to acknowledge teachers uh, or staff in the building that we saw were really, you know, following through those, you know, through the model of PBIS. And so we had different things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, supplies for teachers, right, things that you would normally have to buy yourself. And so we made sure that we had those. Um, and then some of the schools, the school, this particular school, Johnson School, is very good at providing uh, staff with the, you know, what the resources that they need. So it's sort of like, you know, ask and you, you know, probably get it. Um, so one of the things that, you know, we wanted to uh, quickly just share is in terms of the grant under the Safe Schools Healthy Students Grant. The past four or five years, we got to train, it says 205, but that's, you know, what's in paper, then, you know, we know that there's a greater number. Um, and that included staff, t um, um, community providers, parents, um, uh, and all of the people that interacted with children. And on top of that, you know, it really pretty much just reached about 21,000 students, right? At one level or another, all students in the Bridgeport Public Schools get an opportunity to know about PBIS. And so, um, you know, we had uh, seven pilot schools, and then eventually we went through the district um, to implement it. We made it part of the SRBI process, so we revamped all of the forms to include that language of PBIS as well. Um, and then in 2017, uh, we created Empower School, um, a, a system where we would get the big five, as we call them in PBIS, uh, which are the 
um, the student, it's on your last uh, line here, is what, are the, what is the discipline problem? Where are the behaviors happening? At what time of day are they happening? So how many referrals are we getting every day, you know, every, by month? And then who are the students that are giving us, you know, the behavioral issues? Um, again, and that was the, the, what we used. The foundation at Geraldine Johnson, we are the Johnson Tigers. And so our um, expectations are uh, tolerance, integrity, generosity, empathy, responsibility, and self-control. And you see that it, you know, basically says tigers. So we have t-shirts, you know, we have different things, you know, very comfortable environment where we have t-shirts that have these logos, you know, um, stuff on the back. And we walk around the building. The kids have those t-shirts as well. So it's kind of like, you know, again, embracing the whole idea um, of this, you know, the PBIS and the social emotional learning. So we, uh, you know, on top of the behavioral expectations, obviously, we did the things that we know are necessary. We created a behavior matrix. We did a, uh, the, a behavior basically a matrix, which basically lists the different locations and the expectations and what is it that we want them to do. The cool tools, which are the teaching tools, right? Uh, these are what teaches the kids, right? The students, what we are expecting them to do. We have acknowledgement system and there everybody calls them differently. We have what we call the Principles 100 Club. Um, then we created a rule violation system, right? Basically, uh, you know, kind of the, it's not just um, uh, reinforcing the students for the good behaviors, but it is also getting them to understand that there are consequences for your negative behaviors, right? And so we created that, which is the office versus classroom managed behavior. Then we are, you know, big in, in getting parental involvement, and we do a lot of celebrations. Just this past a week or two, when it was our teachers, um, we had an entire week of celebration, and this is coming from the administrators. So when I talk about administrator buy-in, uh, any administrators here today? Yes, okay, great, great, okay, awesome. So you guys are key to the success of any of these, um, you know, approaches or frameworks, okay? Without you, this is really not gonna be successful at all. Um, and at least I speak from experience, right? So we had a school, uh, climate night um, at Johnson School, and that, you know, again, comprised the three different, uh, you know, framework and approaches. And we brought the parents in with uh, students, and we had three different stations. First, we talked them to them in general. Um, we we gave them a, a brochure that we created that talked about, um, you know, how at the school uh, we were envisioning the, um, you know, the um, uh, school climate, right, to creating that pro positive school climate. So we had a, a very nice brochure that we handed out to them. I'll be sure to uh, share that with anybody. If you email me, I'll be happy to share that. And so we had three different stations where they came in, one station where it was the restorative practices, and they had the ability to create these uh, bottles uh, with glitter and different things that they created created and it was to help the students, you know, uh, kind of relax, right, those, you know, bottles that we see, um, you know, in different places. So they have the ability to share those, I mean, to make those and then take it with them. Uh, we also had, um, we also did, um, for the restorative practice, we did uh, a circle and the parents, you know, we were all, you know, part of that as if we were the students. And then for PBIS, we, they all had the opportunity to create a, um, a behavior chart for home. So I taught them, I gave them the, uh, you know, the information and then helped them process that so that they could take it home because, again, we want to make that connection between school and home. And so we felt that that was one of the ways we could do that. Um, and they enjoyed it very much, you know, very good participation. And, um, uh, and it was something, you know, it was hand, they had things that they could take home with them and continue this. Turn the time again. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me see quickly because we have to, I have to give you enough time. So these already she, you know, covered, uh, Carrie covered. Um, so I would have gone into a lot more detail, but that, it's okay. Um, we have at the end, you know, we have our email addresses. Um, I can give you my phone number, probably Carrie too. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to answer, you know, any other questions um, that you may have. So at this time, I will leave it up to, um, does anybody have any questions that we can answer? for you right now. No questions? We did that great of a job? Okay. <laughs> um, approximately how many staff members are in the Bridgeport system? Um, I think it's over 3,000 as far as I, yes. It, I mean, staff members within the schools because then we have, you know, a whole lot of people outside. Right, 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 right. Yes. Uh, for Bridgeport, I, I'm in Stratford. Uh, and I'm sure you experience by my experience uh, the parents that you really want to talk to mm -hmm. 
are nowhere to be found. Uh, <laughs> did you engage those types of parents? And if so, how? Um, I would say yes. Um, and I think sometimes reaching those um, parents that tend um, not to come when you need them to, you need to kind of be um, kind of be tricky. So throwing throwing events, we had uh, like a, a field day last year where we enlisted parents um, to come and help us. So we had uh, like a dunk tank or the jumping thing, things that parents might want to do. We had a barbecue where we grilled for the parents. Uh, they came out. Usually it's, um, or um, parents will come out to celebrate at a, at a student performance. So just making sure we advertise um, food and refreshments. Mm -hmm. And um, it's for, it's for uh, a point that, that parents value. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, that is not um, report card conferences mm -hmm. or academic related. Yeah. So I, I usually connect I with, for a while. yeah, or, or go, to, go to events and games mm -hmm. and you run into all the parents you want to talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I, I do. I also think, yeah, I also think too that um, we, uh, remember the triangle, how we talked about the 80%, the 15% the and the 5%, that also applies to families. Just like we know there are staff members who won't buy in, there are, you know, you know perhaps that five to 10% of parents who don't, you know, get to, to come in. So I think that, you know, those are where we have to put most of the effort into. So we can do, you know, all of these wonderful activities for these parents, but then, you know, providing training perhaps on what are the issues that these, you know, families are dealing with, right? Uh, and it's not just behavior. I mean, we have families, you know, struggling financially or with, you know, housing or with, so bringing those resources into the school so that the parents are aware, right, of what are the things that we can actually do to help them and to work together. Um, so, and then, you know, I mean, unfortunately, we will always have, you know, some families or some teachers or some students who, are, not teachers, excuse me, some staff, right, um, or some uh, students who will not, you know, um, you know, be as successful as we wish they would be. Uh, but again, I think it's putting forth the effort more so into those families. And, and making that first contact a positive one. Yes. 